So uh, the basic concept that we started out with is we thought that it was pretty cri critical to our game to deliver a sense of speed and action. Uh, and uh, going a long way to doing that uh, with the motion blur technique. And we define that here as sampling motion for the duration of the shutter exposure. Uh, and often this is uh, prohibitively expensive for, for real-time rendering. So I'll start off with uh, an example just to give you an idea of what's uh, happening. So uh, uh, initially with zero velocity we have the full resolution texture sampling with uh, all the details faithfully represented. As we accelerate the velocities increase and uh, the texture on the, the road and the environment uh, begins to blur and also with uh, the movement of the cars relative to the screen space. And while you're watching this, uh, see if you can identify any artifacts or issues uh, to do with disocclusions or uh, semi-transparent sampling. Okay, so to cover some related work on, on this topic, uh, we start off with uh, some historical references. Uh, this a uh, beautiful image on the top from uh, distributed ray tracing by Cook et al. Uh, and more recently, a uh, high quality solution using frequency analysis uh, for shared reconstruction filters uh, with these efficient sampling patterns. However, neither of these two techniques are, are real time. Uh, we're also keenly awaiting further uh, console hardware generations where things like stochastic rasterization might be possible. I, and uh, a couple of months ago, Maguire presented a method for tight convex hulls around uh, stochastic rasterized primitives, although uh, there's still some noise issues to address with this method. Uh, we can't use that uh, in current console hardware generations. So for real time on consoles, uh, we uh, recall the accumulation buffer method where you render multiple frames and average them over time. And uh, in GDC 2001, I demonstrated using multi-sample accumulation hardware to uh, do that effect. However, that requires a high frame rate with uh, good coherence between frames to get uh, a good quality image without ghosting artifacts. Uh, another method is to use object extrusion in fins where you generate primitives between the leading and trailing edges of the motion. However, it's an object space method that's not appropriate for, for a racing game where we need to apply the, the effect uh, full screen. So two more techniques, a uh, hemispace post-process which uh, uh, samples velocities uh, in a velocity buffer and anisotropic texture space, which uh, uh, samples along the vo velocities within the texture sampling. And we use a combination of these techniques. So to begin with, image space motion blur involves uh, computing the parapics of velocity based on reprojecting the previous frame's position and we store this in a 2D velocity buffer. And this is shown here uh, with uh, blue and green representing X and Y axes. Uh, we then post-process this buffer with the current single frame sampling the resulting image along the uh, direction of the velocities uh, with a blur kernel. show an example of this. This is a half speed playback showing the image space uh, post-processing sample. So as an image space process we apply the blur to both geometry and texture boundaries.
Uh, but this has a limitation of uh, being bandwidth heavy because we're storing two floats per pixel and uh, we're writing, storing and later sampling in the post-process pass. So we introduced the, the idea of uh, vector motion IDs where we assign one uh, ID to, to each distinct rigid motion in the scene. Uh, and here we see that visualized uh, with uh, uh, the car, the environment, and the sky backdrop, for example, assigned IDs for, for each. Uh, uh, upon sampling that uh, ID buffer, we uh, project the previous frame's position where the, the ID indexes an array of inverse reprojection matrices. So just to see that in the video. So with the collision, there's multiple velocities going on and we can see each uh, object has been assigned a separate ID and uh, recovering nice motions for, for the complexities of the scene. Uh, so, so this re reduces our bandwidth requirement to, to 5 bits per pixel, allowing for 32 mod, uh, motions within the scene. But we still get under sampling artifacts uh, for, for less than 3 milliseconds uh, processing time. So this is where we apply our adaptive sampling uh, according to the velocity across the, the screen. And we can't apply that per pixel with uh, dynamic branching because the current console hardware is too uh, slow to do that. So we, with our racing camera angle, we can apply a static fixed camera-based tiling uh, as, as shown there with a variable number of taps according to the general velocities in that area. And we can go further with uh, a screen space tile classification of velocities to apply an adaptive uh, filter uh, according to regions of higher velocity. So this is showing the, the example with adaptive uh, tiles. So in the distance, uh, one sample per pixel. In the foreground, eight samples per pixel. However, with this, we, we reduce the performance requirement, but we still get shelling artifacts. We could have applied a recursive filter in the image space but there's an additional cost uh, associated with that for, for each resolve of each pass. So instead we look to texture space motion blur to, to, to get the, the further completion of the, the effect. Uh, so here we apply anisotropic mid-chain sampling uh, along the direction of motion into albedo normal map textures. And this acts as a kind of pre-computed blur kernel uh, uh, that's just sampled online. Uh, and as we combine this with the image space sampling, we can do a fast approximation using a MIP LOD bias. This results in some excess blurring, but uh, is significantly faster than the anisotropic texture sampling. So let's say uh, have a look at some comparisons of performance. So to begin with, we start off without any motion blur on the left and uh, our full motion blur effect on the right, uh, taking 1.6 milliseconds for the whole thing. If we add image space sampling with a fixed sample rate of 10, per pixel, 10 uh, samples per pixel, we end up with roughly three milliseconds for, for the image space pass. Uh, if we apply the tiled sampling, we get most of the performance gain 
only applying the samples where it counts, and we get down to 1.7 milliseconds. And with textured space, we complete the technique with uh, good quality uh, on the foreground, and uh, we're slightly faster as we're uh, sampling a lower MIP chain level, so we're making better use of the texture cache. So, uh, for further comparison with the accumulation buffer method, uh, we can show how that looks. So here, here we're applying incremental accumulation buffer method with two frames uh, sampled, and we get uh, ghosting artifacts on objects uh, because of the low generation of those accumulation buffer samples. Okay, so there are a few limitations with this technique. Uh, if we want to address uh, semi-transparent objects, some shadows, uh, skinned animation, uh, we need multiple motion IDs per pixel, uh, or multiple velocities per pixel. Uh, and we address that uh, issue in game by, uh, for uh, semi-transparencies, for example, by reordering layers. So the flare from the headlights is drawn after the motion blur effect. Uh, and in other cases, we just clamp velocities uh, according to the camera scenario. We also have a, an artifact on neoclipping with their uh, inverse projection math. Uh, and it's too slow to apply that per pixel clip in the hardware, so we just, again, scale according to uh, the camera. Uh, finally, uh, for disclusions, we really need to sample visibility over a number of frames uh, to combine into the motion blur effect, and there's a number of possible solutions to that, uh, possibly not real time. Uh, and uh, going back to the video at the start, uh, it was quite difficult to see any disclusion artifacts, so it's a, a low-cost benefit for, for us. So in conclusion, uh, we've got a very fast and good quality motion blur that's, that's useful for, for games. And in the future, we're interested to look at uh, reprojection with uh, uh, frame-coherent accumulation buffer. Okay, thanks. ask one question. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work on the stochastic rasterization front at Stanford. Um, so the question is, and we totally buy that there are many other ways to do it that might be perfectly acceptable, but from the game developer's perspective right now, what does the stochastic or sort of the more traditional way of doing things buy you that this kind of stuff doesn't? Now, I know the last slide said there's little upside in a, in a racing game, but I'm, just, I'm gonna sit down, but I'm just curious about the perspective looking forward from uh, the game developer side. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, with the uh, stochastic rasterization, we think we can address some of those limitations that we identified and came across during the, during the development of the, the real-time method. So uh, handling disocclusions, uh, transparencies, uh, uh, those, those are the kind of still problem areas with the real-time solution that we have. So I, that, that's why we're interested to, to see where we can get a little more help from the hardware. <laughs>